Good morning, countryside. Go ahead and make your way on in and into your seats. My name is Travis Jacobs, and I'm one of the young men preparing for ministry here at Countryside. And we want to welcome you to Countryside here this morning for our worship service. We also want to welcome those in the overflow room uh, joining us from over in the, that room this morning. On your way in, if you did not already, please make sure you pick up a communion cup as we celebrate communion this morning. And then as you do come in, please do make sure you scrunch together, get a little closer to make room for our guests and those who come a little bit later. Please stand with me as we begin to worship the Lord this morning. Psalm 9, 1 through 2 says this, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let's praise the name of the Lord this morning. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly.
with us this morning if you are a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. However, if you've not repented of your sin and believed in Christ for salvation, then I must ask you to refrain. This includes anyone harboring unrepentant sin and anyone who may be under church discipline from our church or another. But please, we do ask that you would listen and engage with the truths of the gospel this morning. Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There's nothing more important than you can hear today than the truth about what Jesus has done for us. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let's take a brief moment in time to go before our Heavenly Father in prayer, bring to him any unconfessed sin, and let's call on him to help us redirect our focus and our meditation this morning. What do you think of when you hear the word punishment? For many of us, it probably doesn't bring the fondest memories. As a kid, I remember instances where our family would be over at a friend's house for dinner, and if I acted out of line or said something shameful, uh, my mom or my dad, they would probably grab me by the arm and they'd whisper, your punishment is coming later. And I knew that was a bad thing. So even as a child, I knew punishment was something I wanted to avoid. Although I was successful at being punished often. But I knew that punishment is necessary when there is transgression. Before our holy God, you and I have committed innumerable transgressions. And we know from Romans 3 that there is no one righteous and that all have sinned. And you and I deserve punishment. And you and I need to recognize our sin as deserving of God's punishment. And we can't grasp the good news until we come to understand that we have sinned against the Lord Almighty. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Punishment brings consequences. Sins committed against God demand punishment. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Who among us can bear the fullness of God's justice and wrath. Who can endure this kind of punishment? If a child can be punished by their parents for acting disobediently, how much more deserving of God's punishment are you and I because of our sinful rebellion? Is there hope? For us, despite our sin? Well, we stand here before God this morning because there was a substitute. Jesus took our place. Our iniquity was laid upon him. Isaiah 53 
teaches us that he was stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, and pierced. The sinless Savior bore our sins and endured punishment beyond compare on our behalf. This punishment upon him was deliberate, and it accomplished its purpose. It did not fail, and praise God that it did. There is hope. We stand in confidence and righteousness before God today because Jesus is the only one who can endure God's punishment for sin. It was necessary to secure our salvation. And all this talk of punishment. But what love that the Father made a way through his one and only Son. God's righteous punishment for sin would be ours to suffer if not for a divine substitute. Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. So church family, this morning as we take communion, remember the one who bore our sins in his body on the tree. The son of man who received the punishment that we deserve. Isn't it amazing that Jesus' death on the cross secured our redemption? Think of these words from the song, Man of Sorrows, what a name. This stanza says, Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. So you can go ahead and take those wrappers off your cups. At this time, I'd like to ask our deacon, Steve Johnson, to pray for the bread before we eat. Uh, would, you, would you bow with me? Uh, Lord God, you didn't deserve, um, Jesus, you didn't deserve our punishment, but you took it to give us life. And we love you for that, Lord, and just pray that we would live this day uh, for your glory. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And I'd like to ask our fellow deacon, um, Scott Jensen, if you'd pray before we drink from the cup. Father, this morning we, we remember your son in his death as he requested when he was meeting with his followers. And we thank you so much for that death that was for us, that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we recognize that on that cross he was bearing the punishment for our sins in order that we might have peace with you. We thank you so much for that sacrifice. We thank you for our Savior in his name. Jesus also said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. You can stand as we continue worshiping. sing perhaps uh, the oldest Christmas song, maybe the oldest song that we have. Um, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, a favorite Christmas song.
We're going to actually introduce a song that's new for Countryside today um, that we wanted to, as a, a worship ministry, wanted to introduce this specifically at Christmas time. And you'll see just because of the lyrics. Um, those of you who went to teen camp this summer know this song really well because it was our theme song at camp. And so you'll be able to sing along. But let's do this as we do always, where Audrey and I will sing the first verse and then the chorus. And then we'll go back to the beginning and you all join in and sing it. So this song's called Behold Him.
God, that's why we're here this morning, is to worship you, behold you, to see you for who you are. We ask as we come to your word uh, that you would do a work in our hearts, uh, that you would turn us from our sin, from our idols that we've carried in with us this week, and that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's a joy to gather together this morning as the family of God um, to worship, uh, to proclaim our praise to God this morning, especially this morning as most of us are worn out and weary. Um, And it's a joy to serve together um, as we've done with Journey to Judea uh, this weekend. I mean, there's more to come today, uh, but hopefully this morning we can all just revel in the truth of what God has done for us in coming to earth. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning, so if you have your Bible, open there, Luke chapter 1, and we'll be in verses 46 through 55. And as you're turning there, I want, I want us to think about Christmas. Um, it's that time of year, as we've sung this morning, uh, some Christmas carols, truths about the birth of Christ. And there's a question that many of us will be asked this year as we approach Christmas, and that is this. How will you be celebrating Christmas this year? This is probably one of the questions you'll be asked the most over the next several weeks. Um, Questions like, well, what are you doing for Christmas? What are your plans for Christmas? And usually this question is just meant to be small talk, but I think it opens a window to more than just a discussion of family traditions or time off work, winter break. Christmas is a season that brings lots of joy for some, sorrow for others, and I think if we're honest, a mixture of both for most of us. And so as we think about Christmas, as we prepare for Christmas, this is why we try to make each Christmas the best Christmas ever. We have hopes of the perfect celebrations. We relive memories and traditions of past Christmases. We anticipate exchanging gifts. I think that describes most of us. Uh, But for some of you, Christmas is a time that you really dread because of painful reminders of loss or broken relationships. But then some of you approach Christmas with a cold cynicism, just annoyed at the season. Why do we need to do all of this? Bah humbug. This morning, we're going to consider a song of exaltation from Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's hymn will describe the common themes of Advent. So historically, the church has celebrated um, in weeks leading up to Christmas what's called Advent with the themes of peace, hope, love, joy. We find all of those in the song we'll look at this morning. But when we look at what Mary is singing here, we will find that these traditional Advent themes are only possible because of something else. And that something else is the mercy of God. Now, it doesn't take us long to look around at our world to see suffering, war, sorrow, and sin everywhere. And we recognize that we are in desperate need of something to alleviate all of this. Our world is broken by sin. There's no peace on earth. This is because of what sin has done to us. Sin prevents your heart from loving God. Sin causes our lives to default toward depression rather than joy. And without the proper perspective of God, we're left with no real hope. Just a few songs to give us some good feelings each year at Christmas time. So this morning, we must hear Mary's song of praise to call us to our only source of hope. And what this song tells us is this. Your only source of hope is the mercy of God. And his mercy is for those who fear him. If you look at the text this morning... Um, I'd invite you to follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. Uh, Let me read this this passage for you. 
from Luke 1, 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, verse 55, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Now, in order for us to understand what's happening here in this moment as Mary sings this song, we need to do some work to set up the context. So let's do that briefly here. As we come to Luke chapter 1 and this scene, uh, remember what's been happening with God's people. After the prophet Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, God has been silent. That doesn't mean that um, God has not been there, or that God has ceased to exist, that God isn't working. It just means that for 400 years, God has not been sending prophets to his people to point them to the covenant promise, to call them to repentance. These are very eventful years, but they're silent. They haven't heard from God for 400 years. But in the first chapters of the New Testament, once we turn from Malachi to Matthew or to Luke, this changes. The silence is broken when God sends his angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary with good news. The time has come. Mary will give birth to the Messiah, and the world will never be the same. As Mary has heard God's promise, and when we get to this section of Luke chapter 1, we find her at the home of her relative Elizabeth, who is also miraculously pregnant. Um, And we'll learn more about that next week um, as we consider uh, a passage, another song of of sorts from Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband. But this week, uh, we see Mary. She's come to visit Elizabeth. And as they've greeted each other, Elizabeth has prophesied, calling Mary's baby the Lord. And then Mary, in response, breaks out into this hope-filled song. So we'll look at this song in three parts. And the first, at the beginning, we're going to see an example of what it looks like to worship God, what it looks like to fear God. Then the second and third sections are really reasons for why We should worship God. Mary lists them out, reason after reason after reason. Notice first, Mary's example of exaltation shows us that the proper approach to God is to fear God with your entire being. To fear God with all of who you are, with everything. Now before we go any further, we need to talk about Fear. The first several verses of this song don't mention the word fear. Mary only mentions it uh, by name in verse 50. But what is woven all throughout this song, however, is an awe and reverence of worship, which is essential to the fear of God. Now, we hear the word fear, and I think we normally think about uh, fear in this way, like a, a phobia of sorts. You hear fear and you think uh, fear of heights or fear of spiders or fear of the dark. This is not necessarily the kind of fear that Mary is describing here. So what is this fear of God? Well, as we look at the description of God in this passage, we see reasons to fear him coming from his greatness, 
His might, His holiness. And so what we understand is when we see God for who He is, it reveals a lack of greatness in us. We see His greatness and we see our lack of greatness. We do not deserve to be in His presence because of our sin. We are not like Him. In fact, because of our sin, God's very presence will crush us and destroy us. And so this is the fear of God, recognizing his greatness. And so there, there is a sense of dread when you understand God for who he is. But this dread is not enough to be a proper fear of God. You see, when God shows his mercy, he provides a way for us to fear God, not out of dread, but in awe. And we're called to draw near to him, to love him, and to serve him. So this fear isn't just a phobia, and it's not just sheer dread. But it's also not just um, some, a response to a circumstance that we don't like. <clears throat> now, we think about fear. Um, not all fear is bad. There are good fears. And, the, and if we think about um, our lives... Um, and the things that we do because we're afraid of certain things, um, you drive the speed limit, or most of you do, uh, because you're afraid of getting a ticket. You don't let your children play in the street. Why? To protect their lives from the danger of traffic. Kids, you obey your parents if the consequences are big enough. You won't stick your hand into the running blade of a chainsaw for fear that it's going to cut it off, right? These are healthy fears. But these are all fears that are driven with a, a motivation that you can manipulate the thing that you're afraid of. None of these motivations for fear quite capture the fear of God. The fear of God is not just dreading getting caught. It's not just protecting yourself or others from danger. See, these are still things that you can control or manipulate to some extent. Now, I think if, if we're honest, the things that we fear the most are the things that we cannot control. And so we fear the weather. We fear the power of water and fire. We fear sickness and death. We fear whatever puts our security or our finances into jeopardy. And so what do we do when those things are, are on the line, when we might lose them? Well, our culture deals with this kind of fear by doing everything possible to regain control, don't we? We build big houses to protect us from the weather. We work hard to store up enough resources to find financial security. We buy insurance to help protect us from catastrophes. But as we think about the things that we fear the most, think about what it's telling you about your heart. If we are honest, I think the things that we fear the most are the things that put our self-love and our own self-advancement into jeopardy. We naturally give total attention to what? To ourselves. Toward protecting Ourself, right? From danger. So what is the fear of God? Well, as we consider all of those aspects of fear, and then consider the words of Mary that, that we'll work our way through here in just a moment. The fear of God involves more than dread, more than phobia, more than consequences, because the fear of God involves a loving relationship. The fear of God involves trust. Fear of God involves hope. So the fear of God is where you know that you're safe, you know that you're secure, but it's not because of you. It's because of the one you're afraid of. The fear of God for the Christian is this. You recognize God for who he is and then respond in humility before him, ready to obey him with a grateful heart, knowing that God will keep his promises. 
Mary's example here in her song reveals two things about this proper fear before God. So we consider the fear of God consuming all of you, your entire being. The first is this, proper fear must come from your heart. Proper fear must come from your heart. Notice the words that Mary uses to describe her response in verse 46. She magnifies God from her soul. She rejoices from her spirit. Now these words, soul and spirit, are used to describe the very core of who a person is. God has created humans in a, to be physical beings. We have physical bodies, but we're also spiritual beings made up of an immaterial part of us as well. Our bodies that, that we live in are currently temporary. These deteriorate, these die, but our soul will live forever. Another way to describe this immaterial part of you is how we talk about our hearts. Now, your heart, in this sense, is not the, the organ pumping blood through your body. No, this is the center of your emotion. This is the center of your desire and your passion. This is where worship takes place. And so Mary is worshiping God from her heart, from her soul. And we fear God. Why? Because God sees our hearts. God understands our soul. And what does he find? Our hearts wander after idols. Our souls worship the wrong thing. And so if fearing God means worshiping him in my heart, it is not true fear of God if it's coming from somewhere else. It's not true fear of God if it's only lip service that I say things I'm just using to jump through the motions or to try to manipulate God. I haven't recognized who he is if I'm not fearing him from my heart. Proper worship is not just a feeling. This fear is not just instinctual reaction. It must come from the heart. This is because it's a heart-level problem. It's your sin that separates you from God. So, friends, fear God from your heart this morning. Magnify him from your soul. The fear of God will take your entire being, and it starts in your heart. The second observation about Mary's fear of God is this. Proper fear results in worship-filled joy. Proper fear results in worship-filled joy. In the second line of her song, Mary points us to the source of her joy. She calls God her Savior. Now, Mary has been chosen to bear the child that is going to bring about her salvation. That's good news. And this good news has filled Mary's heart with joy that has welled up into this song of worship. This joy in Mary's heart is a deep contentment and satisfaction in God that is going to be tested. But because she fears God, nothing that she will face during this pregnancy, nothing that she will face during her life as she raises this boy, nothing she faces as she sees him go to the cross, none of that will steal her joy. Because it's rooted in God. Because God is her Savior. And Mary's worship involves all of her being. We see her spirit rejoicing. Her soul is worshiping. But consider that the way God is using her, it's also going to involve her body, isn't it? As she bears the Son of God, Mary's body is going to be used to do something amazing. Her body is going to stretch and grow as the perfect God-man grows as an infant inside her womb. She's going to experience the discomfort of morning sickness, the excruciating pain of labor. Her body's going to go through changes that only childbirth can bring. 
and incorporated in every stage of pregnancy, you mothers know this well, is a mixture of fear and hopeful joy at the same time. Mary's response to God's promise shows us that fearing God will take all of you. Will you join Mary to magnify the Lord with a proper fear this morning from your heart? If you do, you will find this same joy. Well, Mary has opened her song with this chorus of praise, and it gives us an example of her entire being engaged in worship of God. And now the rest of the song is going to give us reason after reason after reason for this worship. And the first is this, and I've, I've categor- categorized these reasons into two headings. Um, Mary's example calls us to fear God for his attributes. It's verses 48 through 50. Fear God for his attributes, for who he is. And Mary identifies three specific attributes in particular that demand our worship. The first is this, God is gracious. God is a gracious God. Mary magnifies God in these verses because she recognizes that she's become an object of God's grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, which means it's a gift that God bestows freely on whoever he desires. She doesn't use the word grace, but she's recognizing that God is doing something that she doesn't deserve. She recognizes that she's been chosen for a task that she is not worthy of. When Gabriel made the announcement earlier in this chapter, what does he call her? He says, O favored one. That's the grace of God. Notice three things about God's grace from Mary's explanation of what God has done for her. The first is this. Grace is not earned. The grace of God is not earned. Mary describes herself as a humble servant or a slave. She's not been chosen because she holds nobility. She's not wealthy. She's not well-known. She's not without sin. She herself needs a Savior. She already told us that. Mary has been chosen for her role in God's plan sheerly because of the grace of God. And so it's from her lowly state, this humble place, that God has shown her grace. Grace is not earned. Notice, second, that God's grace is never-ending. God has bestowed an ongoing blessing on Mary. And so she says that all generations will recognize this grace. All generations will call Mary blessed. And we see this fulfilled even this morning. Here we are some 2,000 years later, and what are we talking about? This blessing of God on Mary, His grace. God's grace is not earned. God's grace is never-ending. And notice third, as Mary makes this statement in verse 49, He who is mighty has done great things for me. Here we see that God's grace produces results. God's grace produces results. The great things that God will do for Mary is going to raise Mary's humble estate through the promised son that she will bear. And he will ultimately provide for her the salvation that she's already praising God for here. She's confident that God will fulfill his promise. So as we consider God's grace this morning, consider your own standing before God. Friends, we must recognize our humble position before God in order to receive his grace. You see, God's grace does not come to those who do not fear him. Have you experienced the grace of God? Without the grace of God, there would be no salvation. Listen to how salvation is described in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. These verses say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God is a gracious God who saves. 
And his salvation comes to us as a gift to be received through faith. So friends, fear God for his grace this morning. God is a gracious God. Let's look at the second attribute that Mary highlights here. In verse 49, the very last phrase of 49, we see that God is holy. She says, holy is his name. Now, to be holy means to be set apart or to be distinct from something else. And there are two aspects to God's holiness that we see. First, we understand that God is holy because he's set apart from his creation as its creator. God is not a created being. He is the creator. He's not limited by time or space, but he transcends all of these things. He created time and space. God is holy in that aspect. But God's also holy in regards to his moral relationship with creation. God is without sin. God cannot coexist with it. God cannot accept it or partake in it because he's holy. And when we consider God's holiness, this is another attribute that will crush us when we recognize what it means that we are sinners. When we see God's holiness, we recognize our lack of holiness. And what God's holiness does is it shows us our need. But what does Mary tell us? God's might presents us with the solution. It presents us with the solution that we all need for our sin, and that is the mercy of God. And that's the third attribute that we see Mary describes here. God is merciful. Verse 50. Now, it's no accident that this phrase in, in verse 50 lies at the very center of this poem. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. You likely have noticed that this song, like most Hebrew poetry, doesn't sound like the way we write poetry today. In our modern English, we, we would write poetry, um, and it, the rhyme would come from the meter and the sound of the words, right? So we will rhyme with meter and sound. But Hebrew poetry rhymes with its themes or subjects. And usually what you find is the most important theme that's being presented will either be repeated all the way through or will serve as a bookend on each side of the poem or will find its place right in the middle. And that's what we see here. We find this phrase about God's mercy in the very center of this song. Mary, Mary is describing the great things that God has done for her and for every generation. And what is it? Well, God has shown us great mercy. And mercy is the never-ending love of God. Mercy is the withholding of deserved judgment. While grace carries the idea of receiving something good that we do not deserve, mercy is to receive, is to not receive the judgment that we do deserve. Listen to how God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 33. One of the clearest explanations of his character. He says this, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God is a God who is merciful and gracious. And what do we see in this passage? There is both mercy and grace, but there's also judgment and wrath. But friends, we find those same truths in Mary's song as well. We're in desperate need of God's mercy because of our sin. And without God's mercy, we're going to suffer just punishment for our sin, which is death, an eternal separation from God's mercy, to experience only the wrath of God. Well, this description of God's mercy 
in Exodus 33, and in the words Mary gives us here in Luke chapter 1, find its fulfillment in the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus has provided a way for this forgiveness through his death and resurrection. But notice, friends, that God's mercy does not reach everyone. His mercy is only reserved for those who fear him. Well, we've seen Mary's example of worship. Her fear of God takes her entire being. Fear God with all of who you are. And it shapes her entire life. She's discovered these glorious attributes of God. But now Mary describes an additional motive to fear God, which serves as our third main point this morning. And that's this. Fear God for his action. Fear God for the things that he does. And God is always going to act in accordance with his attributes. So we're not going to find him doing things that don't align with who he is. But notice four truths about God that his actions reveal. Verse 51, we see that God has revealed his power. God has revealed his power. Mary describes the strength of God's arm in verse 51. And this is a common way to describe someone's power. Um, If you look in the Old Testament, um, you see this description of a strong arm many times. A strong arm meant that you were not lacking in power. In fact, many times in the Old Testament, we find God rhetorically asking the question, is my arm too short? Is my arm lacking strength? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Well, the answer to this question is an obvious no. Nothing is too hard for God. And Mary sees his revealed power where? Through his son, Jesus. God has shown his strength by stepping into his creation. And even in Jesus' death, when it looks like he's been defeated, God shows his strength because his death accomplishes something. And death could not hold him. As he walks out of the grave in victorious resurrection, notice that Mary tells us that God's power scatters the proud in verse 51. It's a fearful thing to be proud before the living God. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 5, that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And as we consider God's power, there is no room for proud boasting before God. Why? Well, because God has not come to show his mercy to the proud. He's come to show mercy to the humble. The thinking of the proud man will not allow him to accept Jesus as his Lord. And the proud man is incapable of properly fearing God. The proud, in the foolish thinking of his heart, has set himself in opposition to the God of the universe. And God does not tolerate opposition. God will destroy all who oppose him. And God doesn't do this out of weakness. No, He's powerful. He's mighty. God doesn't do this out of a need to feel validated or to take power that he doesn't already have. This is the way our weak world rulers seek for power, always insecure about losing it. No, God's power is not fragile. It is. God has shown us his strength in the strongest way possible. Because he's come not with sword drawn, like you might think. No, God has come to earth as a humble, lowly baby. This is the meek Savior who reveals the strong arm of God. God has revealed his power. Look now in verse 52 for a second action that God has done. God holds the highest position. God holds the highest position. Position. And because there's only room for one God in this universe, God brings down those who would seek his throne for themselves. God brings down the proud who are seeking his position. The mighty ones described here in verse 52 are the kings and rulers of the world. God brings them to nothing. 
because God holds the highest position. And so in God's kingdom, it's not the powerful throne that survives, but who gets exalted? The humble. The humble are exalted, like humble Mary has been exalted, like the twelve bumbling men who follow him, these men of little faith who are Jesus' disciples, they're the ones who benefit, like the sick and the poor. Friends, Jesus brings his kingdom not to the powerful, but to the needy. And who is the most humble of all? Well, the most humble of all is Jesus. This is how we find Jesus described in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says, He, that's Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And it wasn't just any kind of death. Even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The humility of Jesus has secured the highest position. So Mary recognizes God's power and God's position. And third, she describes God's provision. When we see in verse 53 that God is the just provider. You see the theme continuing here. In verse 53, the ones you would expect to be privileged are the ones who are turned away from Jesus. Jesus provides the hungry with good. His provision comes to the needy. And what happens to the rich? Well, the rich end up with nothing. Why do the rich find it so hard to enter God's kingdom? Well, because it is the rich who do not recognize their need to fear God. The wealth that they have gives them all that they want or all that they think they need. They can earn it on their own means. Why do they need someone else to help? They're not willing to admit that there's more to life than material wealth and pleasure. But deep down they know. And that's why they're always in pursuit of more. What does Jesus provide to the poor? Well, Jesus provides them with life. Jesus came as the bread of life to provide forgiveness for sin. This eternal life, the living water, this is given to those who fear him. Jesus is the life giver, and he supplies the hungry and the poor with exactly what they need. Finally, in verses 54 and 55, Mary points us to the faithfulness of God as a final reason to fear him. We see this action from God as God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. If you trace the narrative of the Old Testament, what you find is that all of the Old Testament is pointing us toward Jesus. Every promise made is tied to him. The promise of a redeemer, the promise to bless all the nations through Abraham, the promised king to reign on the throne of David forever. The hope of Israel is found in Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. And so Mary rejoices because through her infant son, God has remembered his mercy to Israel. And he's been faithful to his promises. Now all of these truths about God, his power, his position, his provision, his promises, and even his grace, his holiness, his mercy, these all find their culmination in Jesus Christ, in this promised son who's going to be born from Mary. So, friends, as we conclude this morning, I want to return to the question that I asked at the beginning. How will you celebrate Christmas this year? Will you look to your wealth for joy, 
to your government, to your parents, to your material possessions, to your health, to good memories of past Christmases, or will you look to God through Jesus Christ and fear him? I want to, I, I want to encourage you this year to fear God as you celebrate Christmas and find his mercy. This is your greatest need. Your greatest need isn't on your wish list. Your greatest need is the mercy of God. And his mercy is for those who fear him. Friends, if you've never turned to Jesus by faith, there's no better time of year than now. But you must recognize Jesus as, as more than a baby in a manger. He doesn't stay as a baby in a manger. You, no, you must recognize Jesus as Mary describes him, as your Lord and Savior. You can find all the hope, all the peace, all the joy and love that your heart desires this Christmas. And if you find those things in Jesus Christ, guess what? You'll never lose them. You'll always have them. And you won't have to wait for Christmas to come around each year to find it or to search for it. You'll always have joy if you fear him. Well, let me ask you, friends, even if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, what is your heart posture before God? It can be easy to gather together on a morning like this and to sing songs like Mary sings here and like we've sung already this morning. Magnify the Lord. Rejoice in him. All the while, our hearts are filled with pride. Or we're treasuring riches and material pleasure instead of treasuring God. I wonder this morning, is your heart humble before him? Do you fear God this morning? And that question is really easy to answer quickly without actually evaluating it. Fearing God means more than lip service. It means more than just coming into this room one time a week. It even means more than serving hours and hours and hours on the journey to Judea Trail, like many of us have done. Fearing God is more than a sheer dread or consequence. Friends, fearing God takes your whole life. It takes your whole being. So fear God throughout your week, at your workplace, with your family, in the thoughts that come into your mind, in the words that you speak. Do you fear him when your life seems all put together and everything is going the way you want it? Do you fear him when your life is falling apart? Friends, in either scenario, run to God for his mercy. Because in a fundamental way, our practical lives, meaning the way that we live day by day, what we think about, what governs our decision making, this will reveal where our heart is. This will reveal who we fear. What we value the most is what we treasure. And what puts our treasures in jeopardy is what we fear. So this Christmas, ask yourself, where is my heart? Do I fear God? And finally this morning, in a world that celebrates and rewards pride and self-centered actions and thinking, as you consider that question, do I fear God, recognize that God exalts the humble and he'll scatter the proud. Oh, friends, beware of the pride in your heart. It will mask itself as humility. It will try to morph itself and rationalize itself away, all the while calling you to deeper self-centeredness, which puts you in opposition to God. If you will experience God's mercy, you must fear God more than you love yourself. Your only source of hope is the mercy of God, and his mercy is for those who fear him. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning broken, 
and needy and humble. As we recognize our weakness, our sin that separates us from you. But God, we praise you for the good news of Jesus Christ. As we celebrate his birth this season, I ask that you would do a work in my heart and in the heart of each person here. That you would call us from our pride and self-centeredness. You would call us from our idols that we would fear you. Do this work in us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Before Pastor Mike does his whole spiel, I got a spiel for you as well. Um, I know you don't usually do announcements at the end of our service, but um, there is something that's going to come up, I think, regularly over the next few months. For us, as we prepare to go to two services as a church, one of the important factors to enable our ministry to succeed um, is to have an, enough of a volunteer base to support our ministries. And so it looks like Joe's already put this up there. For the month of December, we're going to focus on, uh, on one particular ministry for volunteer recruitment, and that's our technology ministries. You can see here we have three branches um, within our technology ministry, and each, under each branch we have multiple teams. And uh, what we're really looking for is to identify people who are already members of Countryside, so you need to be a member to serve, you need to be 18 or over, um, and we're looking for both men and women to serve. If something on this list piques your interest, and if you're not 
currently engaged in a regular ministry. Some of you ministry-minded people, you, as soon as you see a need, even though you're serving in like 12 ministries, you feel the burden to, to jump in and engage. This is more for those who we've had a lot of people join in the last year or two, and uh, many of you are still looking for ways to plug in and serve. Here's a great way. We're looking for 10 to 12 people for our technology ministries to hop in and serve. So if you would, uh, if you'd like to talk to me about that, I would love to uh, to, to speak with you. You can talk to me after the service. You can reach me by email. My email's on the church website, and of course, my phone number's in the church directory. So, anyways, I'll, I'll stop there. It's great. I have no spiel. <laughs> but I do have a couple I want to present to you who are uniting with our church, becoming members, and so I'm going to ask Jay and Karen to stand, if they would.